Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming in. I didn't realize at 1130 we would all have already gotten our 10,000 steps in, but yet we're here in Vegas and it's happened. Um, my name is Trent Sanders. I'm the director of healthcare for Kendrill, and this is? I'm Steve Malmy. I work in our worldwide public sector health team at AWS. People say we're two brothers from another mother, but we are really, really excited to be here with you today to talk about something that we are extremely passionate about. So today's session, and we've got an hour, and we intend to sort of walk through some materials, um, and, and we've got a live mic, and would really like to make this interactive to knowing how personal this is for, for many of you as, as healthcare institutions and sort of what this journey looks like. Um, but we're going to talk about a practical approach to moving the EHR to AWS. So let's get started. Two years ago, we all got into retreat mode. It was all about keeping the lights on and serving the institutions and the mission that we had. Last year, in my mind, it was really all about planning. Okay, as we see the light at the end of the tunnel, what are going to be these strategic relationships that we want to partner with as health institutions? And 2022 was to be the year of action. So we stepped into January, and all of a sudden for the first like two quarters of the year, all we could talk about was the skill shortages facing us with the great resignation. I lead a, a CIO roundtable every quarter, and that just seemed to be the topic. Even though we were supposed to be talking about something else, it was skills, skills, skills. Really saying, okay, we, we've, we've carved out some strategic directions. How are we going to augment and, and accelerate this being the year of action? Financial pressures. Really kind of as we got into June, into July, through a couple periods of, of quarterly results from the health institutions as um, you know, elective surgeries still had not gotten back to uh, full volumes, but yet government funding, had, had financial pressures really rocked many, many institutions. And then the third thing it was really the business. Um, the, our business stakeholders from supply chain to clinical applications, to oncology, have just been saying, guys, we committed to doing this. Um, where are we? And, and, and that's really where this partnership between Kindrel and AWS became so important that we say, okay, as we think about these financial challenges across skills, across financial pressures, and across this desire to do more with what we've got, how can we bring great technology and services expertise to drive industry-specific solutions to serve our clients? Steve, any comment on that? Well, AWS has been partnering with Kindrel um, and with many of you as our customers to be able to bring some rock-solid technology to the healthcare marketplace to be able to run the most critical healthcare workloads. What I'm really excited to hear are the announcements that'll come this week that allow you to take advantage of the AWS cloud in terms of completing that journey and optimizing your overall operations as well as your core infrastructure. And so I'd ask you to look in the keynotes, I'd ask you to look even in advance of this conference for some of the key health-related specific announcements. So things like Health Lake Imaging already announced already being demonstrated by a number of our partners at RSNA this week, simultaneous with reInvent. Same thing is true for Health Lake Analytics. So you can do multimodal data query and analytics across any kind of data in healthcare and do that as one singular query as opposed to disjointed queries across different data sources. Again, that's already announced. And we've got a couple of upcoming, upcoming announcements that Adam will highlight. And so look forward to that in his keynote. So it's really important that we get grounded in the mission. I think where we serve in healthcare, it is essential to be grounded in the fundamental mission. And so we've taken that as a services provider with technology kind of around these specific transformational programs 
to really kind of start to visualize, all right, well, what is a practical approach to accelerating this transformation? But before we jump into that, I just want to talk a little bit about who is Kindrel. So Kindrel is a company that is only a year old, but we're 90,000 people strong. We have been serving over the last 30 years the backbone of not only the healthcare institution across payer provider, but many different industries. People look to us to help them run their mission critical workloads. We are the one in the trenches, on the ground, managing EHRs, which we've been doing, for example, for Epic for over 12 years. And it's about how you take institutional knowledge, understanding, again, the mission of healthcare to really start tackling these problems. And the, pr the problem that we've seen as a services provider is really how do you target the mission critical? How do you go after an Epic or a Cerner or a Meditech? I mean, it's just like such a big animal. It's a proprietary system. It's got so many integrations inside and out. Where do we even start? But, and there is a huge but, if we can figure this out, this is our one opportunity to actually jettison this data center in our hospital basement. And like what a relief that would bring and where would the possibilities go if, if we could actually execute on that. That's the mission of what we do in Kindrel, is to say how do we take a complex problem, a complex workload, aligning great technology in AWS and really come together in a cohesive solution through the design, the migration, and ultimately the management and continuous progress through that application lifecycle. You can see from the partners that are the, the clients that we're so privileged to serve, many of which were Kindrel and AWS are having joint conversations and thinking how do we bring this message together so that it's not one point of view, but yet a point of view really aligned on a mission and focus. And so why are we Kindrel obsessed with AWS? Steve, I'll let you walk us through the next chart. Absolutely. Actually, to take, out, take off from where Trent left off, one of the things that you hear in our leadership principles is a principle of invent and simplify. And uh, this slide actually in this program that we're talking about here that we've just launched is a really good example of that. So I'm blessed with the opportunity to be able to meet with partners, to be able to meet with customers in healthcare, literally the world over. And after being hit upside the head a few hundred times with the same comments, uh, it finally dawned on us that we should invent and simplify a great approach to be able to onboard simply into the cloud. And what we heard over and over from many healthcare customers and from partners is that what do we need to be able to step from where we are today into the cloud? And so there's a simple formula that we kind of concocted based upon the feedback from all of you. And that is, first of all, regardless of what country I'm in, I need to be able to have an environment in the cloud that is compliant, follows local policies and regulations, so it's an industry certified landing zone with somebody other than AWS actually saying, yep, check, that's certified. And it runs in Switzerland or the Netherlands or North America, US or Canada. And so in each one of those countries, having that exact kind of compliance formula completely packaged and ready to go. Number two, my staff, in most cases, my staff as a healthcare provider is not cloud proficient. And so they haven't spent a lot of time training and coming up the educational ramp. And so we need some really clear training by role and responsibility. So what is my database administrator versus my network administrator versus my security and compliance officer? How are they trained and operating in the cloud? And then finally, to pull all those together, I need something to actually land in that environment so I can get my fingers dirty and actually understand how, the, how all this works together. That's exactly what you see on this slide and it's exactly what Kindrel is actually prepared to provide for you and with you is an industry landing zone, healthcare industry landing zone. So industry compliant environments with training, with a workload, and we typically see simple workloads 
um, some disaster recovery or training workloads, some administrative healthcare applications that you can simply move into the cloud and then just get used to the ongoing operation and administration of those systems. And so this can typically take place over a four to eight week period um, and gives you a really good leg up in terms of an on-ramp into that overall cloud infrastructure and operation. Steve said something really, really important there, which I don't know if you caught, which was four to eight week period. That is why we as Kindrel love this chart. For years, we have been building EHR environments and managing them as custom one-offs. In hundreds of institutions, it's built this way to this application specifications. We go through our quarterly or annual upgrades. We're constantly dealing with new hardware changeouts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So from the services side, beyond just the infrastructure, right? How are we going to make it compliant? Which previously was a very laborious process, which caused many stop gates and micromanaging across the lines of security and infrastructure. But if we could templatize that, and to me that is the beauty of the landing zone, it's a template. It's a framework to be able to standardize eliminate one-offs going forward across a mission critical workload like Epic that says out of the box, it's HIPAA and high trust certified. We've already got the training plan built for each of your role types and personas within your organization for how they can best take advantage of this journey. And the third is Again, it's an infrastructure as code template. We can deploy an epic template in an hour. An hour. That's insane. And oh, by the way, that template for production, as an example, is spread across three availability zones. Each of those availability zones is spread across three data centers. So again, I'm gonna walk that back. In an hour, we can deploy a mission critical workload spread across nine different data centers. Can you only imagine the complexity of creating that in your own on-premise environment? And for us as a services provider, the opportunities that it brings when we can sort of step out of the bounds of this back office blocking and tackling of here's the, you know, 52-point checklist for HIPAA, and here's the third party we've got to go get for high trust, and here's the very expensive one-off training plan, and oh, by the way, the six months it's going to take us to build this, four to eight weeks compresses the timeline to efficiency. It makes it much more real for our customers to really begin shaping the value. So let's get into the benefits of EHR on cloud. Steve, you want to start us? Sure. Happy to. Um, what we see time and again is that the cloud provides you with some very fundamental advantages in terms of running healthcare workloads. So we talk in this slide about EHR on AWS, but the story is really much broader than that. It's really healthcare in the cloud. Who's the cloud that runs healthcare? And that's our objective. That's just number one, uh, super clear for us. So to be the cloud that runs healthcare, we first of all, we admit that we don't have all of the assets that are necessary to do that. And so there's key partnerships like Kindrel, there's key partnerships across the EHR space. So we work with 12 of the 18 leading EHR providers of the world. We work directly with eight of the 12 leading medical imaging companies of the world. We work with the leading and are the sole provider to the top genomics company of the world. And so bringing that kind of an ecosystem together is super critical for all of you because we understand that healthcare isn't run by EHRs alone. It's run by hundreds of different systems that all interconnect, interoperate, and support the care delivery process for every individual patient. Mm -hmm. 
And so that's a big part of this. Um, in addition to that, when you operate in the cloud, you get some fundamental assets and benefits. So things like improved security, improved monitoring and management. So that industry landing zone that we talked about, that industry landing zone, when you set it up and it complies with all the local regulations and policies, you also set up something called Control Tower and CloudWatch. And what those systems do is actually make absolutely sure that that environment stays compliant with all of the local regulations. So if somebody goes in and flips off the encryption bit on your environment, the flags go off and everybody gets alerted that, hey, something's out of compliance, please go fix this. And so those kinds of simple examples of how you can differentiate and more efficiently operate in the cloud we call out many of those here on the slide, and we're happy to dive deep with each of you to talk about your specific environment and how we can enable that. Yeah, and just to, to, to follow back and go forward just for one second, when we talk about the cloud workload picture, that is essentially exactly what you're seeing here. This is what the template looks like. Um, AWS has put incredible investments and has scaled substantially over the last couple years and their ability to accelerate the performance requirements needed for the key, HR, key EHRs out there, specifically um, you know, Epic for reference. And just to give you like a frame of, of, of reference of the type of scale we're talking about, um, two years ago, AWS could support roughly maybe 25% of the Epic installs out there. Today, they can support up to 90% of the Epic installs. And remind me again, the number of GREVs that are supported today? Uh, today, it's 26 million. 26 million. Um, but the scale of, of that growth over a two-year period has just been dramatic. And I think that's what's exciting for an organization like us, which is, okay, we've established this template. This template is secure by design. It's got pre-built networking fabric, sort of purpose-built for integration for your 50 to 100 interwoven applications around it so that we truly can start thinking about the EHR as the landing zone. The EHR, in my opinion, is the landing zone. It is not the means to the end. I personally think that moving your EHR to the cloud is really this table stake step so that you can begin focusing on the surrounding applications and having meaningful transformation discussions with your clinical lines of business, which we'll talk about a little bit more throughout this presentation. Um, but again, if you think about you know, the benefits is this pre-built template and a model that is now set to scale, but supported on the back of AWS, which drives a level of R&D that a company like myself can only dream of. So what's a practical approach? So we've talked about this being secure by design, built for integration for other applications to, to drive interwoven connectedness. Really this fundamental step is like this landing zone concept. So how do we go about our approach in, in, for clients with the migration of an EHR? Many, when sort of kicking off this conversation, thought, hey, you know, let's just move our disaster recovery environment. That seems like the first step. Um, however, given sort of the business case and financial elements, particularly like in an epic environment, your disaster recovery mimics your production environment, your alternate production. And so from a cost basis standpoint, we found through experience that as you're sort of going through this approach, that doesn't necessarily lend itself to the right ideal phases. But we have broken this down from simplicity's sake to think about three phases. Those three phases can be executed anywhere between kind of six months from, full, from beginning stages to full-scale production to nine months to 12 months but it doesn't need to go any longer than that. And, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some actual real life examples, knowing that, okay, if I can deliver, as Steve mentioned, a ready workload with interwoven integrations in four to eight weeks, 
um, then that sort of is a true game changer as you think about these, these multi-prong migrations. So phase one, training. Why training? The real purpose be by, behind the training recommendation is it is a great way of getting your users and your community access. While you're working through kind of the beefier, heavier workloads in the background, you're already starting to drive institutional awareness, you're starting to drive education, you're driving buy-in, you're driving this fast-fail approach of your clinician team engaging and saying, oh, this cloud environment is, is no different, and quite frankly, they shouldn't even know if it's, if it's in a cloud environment or not, but yet it's a great way for really kind of spearheading that, that approach and, and getting that um, experience going. We then kind of move to alternate production. That would be a natural, <coughs> excuse me, a natural migration and preparation for, for your non-prod and production. But, but this has sort of been a, a working effort with us saying, okay, what is this practical approach? What's gonna be the best way that sort of drives this user buy-in? You create these stop gates every step of the way. So at alternate production, you're now, you know, truly being able to say we're running a, a, a mission critical alternate production workload in cloud. We're gonna monitor that over a three month period as we're preparing for, for non-prod in production. And Steve, you've been living many of this. Um, any comments on this approach? Yeah, this multi-stage approach is exactly what we see uh, both being comfortable to <coughs> the EHR providers, all the various integrated apps, um, as well as to our customers. And so it's a very pragmatic approach, just step by step in terms of engaging each one of these environments and making sure that you understand the priorities of each workload, and be able to work those across the cloud um, and deploy appropriately. Sorry, <clears throat> this, not, I'm, I live in Tennessee <clears throat> and uh, it's really humid, so we're, uh, I'm not used to this <clears throat> dry weather yet. Um, let me catch my uh, yeah, yeah. click a, and uh, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll keep going here. So um, we talked about the approach, three phases. How do we really make this real? Our recommendation, um, and this has been a lot of work in the making, particularly over the last year, is we have jointly established a a center of excellence between AWS and Kindrel, truly a healthcare center of excellence. It is about both institutions coming together in, in efforts to align directly with an organization to make this real. Everyone talks about workshops, but this is essentially a, a center of excellence team coming in through a one to four week sprint to help you build a business case, to help you structure an approach, to help you identify the personas and how you drive business buy-in across the different phases of training and how you drive that engagement to alternate production, to non-prod and to production. We recommend that it starts with bringing both organizations together in a two hour workshop. Um, this is a, a purpose built workshop that we have jointly written together in efforts of lessons learned through other, you know, EHR specifically epic migrations to cloud and how we can be very open and sort of sharing those lessons learned um, and, and the stop gates along the way as you prepare your phases. And we do, again, recommend the three phases. You know, Steve, this is something that, that your team has been, you know, quite passionate about, which to me is really this education step and what we found with mission critical workloads is there's a, a need for you know, educating the different stakeholders and alignment. You know, when you're thinking about, hey, if we're just moving an analytics application to the cloud, like I get it, we did it, it's done. But like the stakeholders that are involved from you know, your chief nursing officer, chief medical officer, informatics, really kind of getting that stakeholder alignment um, it, it is critically important at these different stop gates. And we can help you through what's proven methods and, and how it's been done. Steve, any comment? 
Yeah, actually, to comment on it, why don't you click forward and, and uh, rather than commenting, I'll just give you an example of this. Uh, and so, uh, and actually while I'm speaking just for a moment, Dr. Rob, if you wouldn't mind joining us on stage, that'd be fantastic. Um, so Dr. Shafiq Rob is uh, the chief information officer for the entire health system, um, as well as the executive vice president um, and CIO at Tufts Medicine. And so he helped lead the very first AWS cloud deployment of the Epic EHR. Uh, and he went well beyond that. And so what you'll hear his colleague and, uh, and technical leader, Jerry Marut, talk about is the time for proof of concepts in the cloud is over. It's time to go. And that's actually, we see that in the market right now with many customers that we're engaging. So this time last year, there was about 20 plus or minus uh, customers that we were actively talking to about moving to the cloud. That number's 80 plus today. So four times that number within a year's time period. And what we see is very much a reflection of what Shafiq and his team have been able to deliver at Tufts Medicine in terms of not just moving a couple of workloads, but actually looking at re-envisioning how the EHR and how the entire healthcare ecosystem needs to operate in a cloud environment and can take advantage of all the new technologies and capabilities that are available in that environment. And so Shafiq, if you wouldn't mind just highlighting your story for us, that'd be fantastic. First of all, I didn't know I was going to speak. <laughs> they offered me a jacket and then, so uh, thank you for, and I don't work for AWS, I don't work for Kentrell, I work for the United States of America. <laughs> so healthcare, everybody talks and everybody talks nonsense. Healthcare is behind, technology is behind, and they all forget that when COVID hit, everybody came to the hospital and healthcare came through for them. When it comes to giving money, they all forgot about healthcare. So this was my complaint that <laughs> I had to take it out of my heart. Uh, those of you who know me, you can Google me. Those of you who don't know me, you can Google me. My name is Shafiq, last name is Rab, R-A-B. All my life, I've been trying to do something to pay my debt to this great country where I can walk free and do things. America is a land of possibilities. And we do things with innovation, do things with something in our heart. The heart is to serve the patient and the community and the doctors and other people. Technology was not mature. Technology became mature slowly and gradually. Interoperability is still there to be maturing. So when we talk to AWS, uh, we had to choose between cloud providers. Some didn't have the enough GREF, some didn't have the IOPS. Taking the EHR to the cloud is a piece of cake. It needs nothing. All you need to do is have a good team, get trained, and go with uh, Amazon Pro or a co company like Kendrill or uh, Jeremy will talk tomorrow Mendeley Bay is too far away. I'm not going there, but you can. Uh, it took me a long time to find this place. Uh, and my team member, one of them is sitting there, right there. I just saw her. She said, I work for you. So that means I'm a, not a good leader. Having said that, when we started our journey, and I'll tell you very quickly because I'm timing myself, thank you for letting me speak. It's never the electronic health record. It's always the ecosystem. When you go to a hospital, if you just have an EHR and no EKG, no X-ray, no other things, we can't take care of you. Problem is, until unless all of you get together, including Kendrill, to say that we will do cloud computing, we will do edge computing, we'll, we'll follow a standard. That's the reason I, uh, the, I'm talking to you, all of you, because Make Epic work or Cerner work or other EHRs work. There are about 129 to 300 other applications that work in the hospital. Some of them can't even move to the cloud. Forget about taking them to the cloud. So in our approach, we went, uh, the word is, we went directly into production. And the speed that they were talking about, that is correct. 
Uh, it is possible within a week, but it took us 14 months to go live. We've been live for seven months. We are in seven different, uh, five different regions. Amazon went down, AWS did not, because we have two different connections in other places. So the request is get people trained, the cloud center of excellence, work with ProServe and other companies that will help you to go forward. But you cannot just take the electronic health record. Epic is a great company. Everybody complains about it. I love Epic. I made my career out of Epic. I've done seven implementations of Epic. My children are going to college because of Epic. So I cannot talk bad about Epic. They are a great company. They will never let you fail. I guarantee you that. They have never let me fail. So that means in that ecosystem, you have to have partners. The request is don't go by yourself. Go with all the other applications as well. And then you have to have connectivity. So we have a 100 gig pipeline, which is pretty fast. I call it Likety Split. It has helped us to transform things very quickly. We needed to do things. You can spin it up. You can spin it down. Saturdays and Sundays, you can decrease the cost by decreasing the number of servers you want to be. There's no such thing as a server in the cloud, but you can decrease the compute. At nighttime, you can decrease the compute. If you have a data center, what are you going to do? Hang the server around your neck and walk and take a half a server? It doesn't work that way. And if you're a merger and acquisition, you got to wait for six months to get something done. So scalability and cybersecurity, all those things come with cloud computing. Everybody will complain that it's not possible. Like these two gentlemen are saying, we should go slowly and blah, blah, blah. You can do that. You can be like us, done with it. Having said that, uh, he's asking, he asked me that, what else we are trying to do? We still are trying to clean up our data centers, start, still trying to keep moving things to the cloud. It will be ended, and then we'll have no data centers at all. No data center at all. Everything in cloud, so that when we need to scale, create something, and the last thing that I'm trying to do, which I will announce, which is a ransomware resilient cloud environment. Mm. 90 days. Any other thing you want to know or ask? No, I don't know what I was supposed to say. No, that's perfect. That's perfect, Shafiq. And so I just appreciate the overview and to highlight what Dr. Rob and his team have done. You know, they, they went from six different EHRs to a singular instance of Epic. So I just have to correct it. 28 different electronic health records, not six. Because we also did our community physicians, we also converted them into electronic health record. So I'm five feet, four, four inches tall, but I do have a heart. And I will take on, because don't forget the American resolve. We will take you on. We will make healthcare better. It will get there what it has to, because the pain will not be relieved. Somebody, I met a young lady yesterday, she's uh, opened up a company known as Wander, dot health. What she's trying to do, she, uh, all over the world, she's trying to get all the different hospitals. So when you go visit Portugal and you get sick, you have no clue where to go, right? So how do you transfer the data from one place to the other place? You can't until unless you are a fire standard. So I'm also a proponent of fire. If not, look me up. I'm the starting founding board member of Da Vinci. So all those things that we do here is to make sure interoperability happens, cloud computing happens, so that you can do logarithms in the cloud and have the benefit at the edge. It's kind of very, very important. But this can only happen. I'm going to say it only one time, and if anybody's quoting me, please don't spread that to anybody. It's all about money at the end. So be smart about your ROI, because you have to convince your CFO, you have to convince your lawyers and other people. And one plug for AWS, they didn't pay for me, but Steve did put this meeting in my calendar, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> but I gotta tell you something about AWS. AWS will be with you all the way. Yeah. They are a good company, they help me, and I have to thank you and your company for that. The good people, man. Yep, thank you, Shafiq. Thank you for letting me share the stage with you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just hang up for one more second. Um, just one final question and, and really appreciate that. But 
You talked a little bit about the approach. I mean, Tufts Medicine went all in, not just with the EHR, but essentially, I, I believe it was around 50 or more applications that, that you took along with it, and there's still more work left to be done. But, you know, for the, the clinician teams or hospital teams in this room today, you know, knowing what you know now, and, you know, you help sort of guide and shape how we would think advising other clients sort of in this practical approach, what would be some lesson learned that you would have for this audience as they get ahead of this and, and thinking about this, uh, this transformation? Uh, I'm going to tell you, I had no clue how many applications I had. And nobody even told me. Like, I found three of them last week. Uh, this is how healthcare works. Some of them under the desk, some by their propriety, whether it's a cardiology department, radiology department, and some had their own network as well. So try to find that out, what you have. Second, uh, second thing that I learned is that IT is not the boss of people. People are the boss of IT. What that means is that if you're trying to get rid of a uh, software and you're trying to shut it down, uh, make sure that the operational leaders are actually the one who are asking to shut it down. Or you may not have a good job, or you may not have a job. Third thing that I learned, that as we are doing these things, uh, and we are trying to do app rationalization, which everybody talks about, put the onus on the operational leader to call the vendor and tell the following, so they become your ally. If you are not on the latest version. Like, you know, we still have biomedical equipment that use Windows 7 and Windows 95. I'm sorry, Windows XP, which expired like 900 years ago. And, uh, and there is a, there's a cybersecurity risk and nobody cares. So what we learn is that if the operational people are with you, then you become more strong. Uh, and you can actually effectively make a change. Well, what you ask about what I learned is that uh, you really have to work with your clinicians too because here is the perception. Uh, every time something happens, they'll say, because it's in the cloud. Uh, it's no different being in the cloud or in your basement or in a data center. It's just the access to it, right? So, uh, I mean, this is a different company. I don't know I should talk about it or not, but I was with uh, Apple and we were talking about Mac. Then you saw the announcement, right? And Epic was there who supported us. We said we want to use Mac. And we want to directly do that and don't worry about the hyperdrive. So industry changes when you actually explain to people things. So don't forget your clinical leaders, don't forget your administrators, and actually explain to them what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And don't say we are going to the cloud because everybody gets afraid of the cloud. We had to move uh, 40 million uh, faxes, believe me, we had faxes. We still use fax, everybody does. It'll never end, most probably it'll end by my grandchildren. Uh, but we could not move those documents. We went to the vendor, and the vendor said that it'll take them seven months. We just scaled in AWS, we were done in 92 hours. So that, and then we shut it down. So the power of cloud, and then something happened and there was a gl glitch. Uh, the entire AWS system that we had for the cloud went down, came back up less than a second. Nobody even knew that we went down and came back up. So that speed, that ability can happen only when you're on the cloud. Otherwise it does not. Let me tell you one more thing which, you, which we learned is that you don't have to have a Wi-Fi and you don't have to have a T1 line or a 100 gig line. You can use your cell phone to connect to the cloud like you do for Amazon, which most of you did. You can't do that in your data center because you will have to have a VPN. I hate VPN because the maximum speed of VPN is 1.5 megabyte, that's it, do TLS. So you can go to real natural speed. I didn't know that, I learned that, because a lot of still industries still use VPN. So you gotta talk to the uh, 
the technical people and the last thing that I'm going to tell you for you if you want to do this as a business and AWS please try to finish the negotiation as fast as you can because people change the CTO left the CEO left then you have to start the conversation all over again and it takes three to four months there's a big company GE we had to redo that and finally GE is in the cloud with us so we took 129 applications to the cloud because they're your partners. That's why I'm addressing everybody in the room. Without all of you banding together, LK is not gonna work, ever, period. Uh, people just think that since I did it, I did the DPC, I did the blue button API, so I should start bragging I'm very smart and very good and handsome and good looking. It's meaning crap, it means nothing. Till we, all of us are together. Only then healthcare is efficient because the ultimate game plan. It's not going to the cloud, it's the data, yep. the insights, the wisdom, the longitudinal care, that can only happen. Like think about it, and I'll take one minute, I'm sorry to interrupt and take your time. Like nobody takes care of you if you go to a person, hey, this is my 20 years of health record, uh, what should I do for the next 10 years? No doctor has that clue. Yet you have to live for the next 10 years. And you have no idea, you're just playing Russian roulette, eating cheeseburgers or whatever you like, and then people are having difficulty. You see a normal person running, uh, and, and a person like me not running, and I don't die, and the person dies. Because the healthy guy died. What happened, man? How did he die? He's a marathon runner. Well, Shafiq, who's not at all like a healthy person, still living, right? So there is a longitudinal story both image-wise, EKG-wise, EHR-wise, that insight it will never be possible until unless you are in a computing environment where you can run those reports, yeah. that you can give that insight. That's why you have to go to the cloud, not because I'm saying so. And I had to be the first because we had the phenomenal team at Tufts, right? We did it ourselves. And how do we do it? It's known as sheer brute force. That's me. He's great, isn't he? Give him a round of applause. Thank you. I did not, and I didn't realize that they'll make me talk, so I have no idea what I said. Forgive me if I said anything bad. Just good that we have all of that recorded, you know? So, all right, bring it back home on the, just to wrap up this slide. Training environment, it gets hands on. You get access to connecting via Citrix or connecting via VMware Horizon. Like it gets your people on the system. If you go with alternate production, it's sort of this thing that everyone says is working, but folks really aren't messing with it. So if you start with training, you really begin to accelerate. Item number two, which we didn't put on this chart, is the read-only environment. That is, you know, this specialty environment um, that, that Epic has established, but AWS has fully embraced, which is this read only, you know, essentially ransomware proof environment. Again, you can get that up and going. That's a quick win that you can deliver to the enterprise that says, hey, if production and alternate production fails, like as a part of this journey, you know, let's have their ability to, to support the system. And, and I think that's what's so encouraging about this maturity step here is like, we're talking about essentially 100% uptime. When you think about a production environment across nine different data centers, three availability zones, an alternate production template design spread across two availability zones, six different data centers, like the scale of that, how you could create that yourself in a cost-effective manner, it's not possible. And so just purely from an infrastructure standpoint, um, it, it's a game changer. But let's. Uh, Let's keep rolling. Uh, we just, we've got 15 minutes left here and we probably have five more minutes of presentation and we'll open it up and spend 10 minutes on Q&A. But Steve, why don't you talk a little bit about the training programs that y'all have spent so much time putting together sure. in this material for, uh, yep. for So what we have done and what you'll all see as you talk to the AWS team is we've hired some really smart people. We pulled together some really good content and that content helps drive best practices uh, for you as well as for our AWS partners. 
That content includes things like Migration Hub that manages and monitors each of the sequence of steps and the Gantt chart of activities that are necessary to actually migrate and operate into the cloud. It's a mapping of individual roles within your team to the AWS catalog of education and certifications and so that you have a role-by-role -role training plan regardless of what operating environment you're going to move to the cloud, regardless of what operating environment you're going to move to the cloud. We've also got a best practice framework for deployment scenarios. And so Trent's already talked about the sequence of steps and the priority of those steps as we migrate from an on-prem to a cloud operating environment. And so each one of these is designed as a best practice so that you can pick them up and reuse them time and again to make sure that you're doing and proceeding along the best path possible. Now, this is true for EHR. It also is true for the entire ecosystem. Yeah, that, that, that's really well said. And you talked at the beginning of the presentation about the idea of templates and this architecture that's like truly purpose-built. These architectures are published. Um, they're ready for your review. And I mean, that's exactly why we put together a center of competence and a program to kind of you know, get you through in a workshop that says, okay, if we get the configuration guide, from your EHR vendor, we will do our backend homework. We will come in and say, look, based upon you know, your specifications, this is exactly the templates that you would need on AWS, the exact workload across training, read only, alternate production, 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 and then here is how we gain the mind share of your team through all of the operational best practices and the migration approach. And that's really what the, the workshop and the one to four week sprint is all about is like truly putting this roadmap together. So let's get to the money chart. Much like, as was mentioned, it's moving the EHR to the cloud, it's just the first step. It's this table stakes effort so that we can help collectively take really, really good technology and your data and start driving more insights what, I mean, we've been on this journey with AWS for a little over a year now, and the acceleration, like what is going to be announced this week with um, the announcement of, of the imaging suite and solutions, like it's here. It's not like on the horizon, it's here. So that when you move your EHR to the cloud and you take that mission critical step, which oh, by the way, has already been templatized for you in a secure, trusted and, and certified manner, but it lays the foundation so that you can now take these surrounding applications either in, in bulk or one at a time of really trying to, to accelerate your use cases and serving the business. Steve? Yeah, so as we work with various healthcare providers across the globe, um, we walk over to the procurement closet together. We turn the knob, open the door, and out spills three decades of unabated procurement that was never rationalized over that time period. And so looking at that whole collection of applications spread out across the floor, what we've defined is a really good approach, a systematic approach to reviewing and assessing all of those applications. And so we look at those applications and we first do a mapping of how those apps integrate to critical clinical workflows. And so, how do I need to think about the integration of laboratory, pharmacy, radiology, as it pertains to that critical clinical workflow, number one. Number two, I go back to the integration engine and I look at the roster of integrations that are actually, the messages that are actually flowing across each of these systems, and I use that to prioritize the list a second time. The third, third step we take is we actually go through that entire inventory typically numbering somewhere between 300 and over 3,000 applications for a healthcare system. And we put that through an, anal an analysis process where we look at, here's the apps that are already on the AWS cloud, here's the apps that are moving to the AWS cloud, and here's the apps that are not moving. And to Shafiq's point, as we talk about this, um, we actually sit down side by side with our customers and make calls to each of those vendors. And when you make a call and you're on the other line with a vendor and saying, would you like to come to the cloud 
or would you like us to make another choice? It's a rather compelling conversation. And so it really spurs things along. And what we see is a fantastic ecosystem of the most popular healthcare applications migrating to the cloud and enabling this kind of integrated ecosystem experience. And so that's the journey that we're on right now. About 50% of the customers that we talk to, um, about 50% decide to take the entire portfolio to the cloud along with the EHR as a first step. The other 50% prefer to do workload by workload and do things like cloud read only or training environments as basically a warm up lap before they take additional steps to the cloud with other workloads. So just to, to, to summarize, uh, we hope in this presentation today, you've gotten to you know, see from a services organization that does this every day and partnering with a technology company, uh, tackling a mission critical workload, really defining an approach, a logical path to say, how do we go about tackling this problem? But then ultimately understanding the end game and the end game not being just, it's about moving the EHR to cloud. The end game is this. It's so that you as an IT organization or as a health institution representing the business can talk about value-based care. And it really does start by saying, okay, as Steve just mentioned, the application assessment that they do for you, I'll give you an example, because we're jointly doing this with a customer next week in the Northeast. Um, clearly, they have an affinity for needing to move to the cloud to drive business transformation. But what's come out of this assessment is essentially a process that says, okay, by taking this critical step and moving this EHR to the to the cloud and looking at all of your applications from N4 to you know, change to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here is sort of this path and here are the Amazon pre-made consumable services around you know, AI, ML, or um, you know, fast, fast pass around supply chain, et cetera, that really kind of help you with this application retirement or simplification process that begins this quick win and really allowing you to have a much different conversation um, you know, with your business stakeholders in driving this. With that, we've got a minute left. Um, and team, we really appreciate um, y'all being here today. We, at one o'clock, there's going to be a specific healthcare industry lounge for all of us to congregate and get to know one another a little bit more. Um, and so I believe it is just right outside this hallway um, on, on the main area. But again, a healthcare specific industry lounge at one o'clock. Y'all are welcome to join us. We'd, we'd love to meet you and talk a little about your organization. So thank you guys again. Thanks, Steve. Yep. Thank you, Trent. Thank you, Dr. Rob.